Well, let's begin. My name is Randall Kennedy, and um, I have the great privilege of uh, being with you to continue a, a lecture series on um, the Civil Rights Revolution. This is the uh, fourth of five, and uh, today we have two questions on the floor. Question number one is, um, what prompted the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965? Why did there have to be a Voting Rights Act of 1965? Um, and then the second question is, what of it? What, 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 you know, what, uh, what was its accomplishment? So question number one, why did there have to be a Voting Rights Act of 1965? The um, most authoritative and I think succinct and um, in certain ways revealing uh, answer to that question is found in a Supreme Court, uh, a Supreme Court ruling. The Supreme Court ruling is South Carolina versus Katzenbach. South Carolina versus Katzenbach was decided March 7th, 1966. I'll come back later to talk about the importance of it being decided on March 7th, 1966. But on March 7th, 1966, the Supreme Court of the United States handled a case. It's unusual in certain ways. Uh, again, let's just go back to the title. So South Carolina versus Katzenbach. Katzenbach was Nicholas Katzenbach, the Attorney General of the United States. The South Carolina, joined by some other Deep South states, sued, uh, petitioned the Supreme Court of the United States to take the case as a case of original jurisdiction and uh, sought a declaratory judgment from the Supreme Court of the United States to declare that the, um, at least certain parts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 were unconstitutional. And South Carolina also sought an injunction to prevent the Attorney General from uh, enforcing certain uh, provisions of the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we'll talk about those provisions later, but again, our first question, why why there have to even be a Voting Rights Act of 1965? Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, Chief Justice Warren's direct response to that question. Uh, before I do that, I want to harken back to my very first lecture. The very first lecture, I talked a little bit about the landmark case, Brown versus Board of Education. And one of the things I said about Brown versus Board of Education is that despite it being such a famous case, you know, this iconic case, <coughs> it's not a very revealing case. I, I talked about how you could read Brown versus Board of Education and go away not knowing very much at all about the realities of de jure segregation. It doesn't say much about de jure segregation. It doesn't say very much about uh, racial oppression in uh, the Deep South uh, in the mid 20th century. It just doesn't. And I talked about the reasons for that. Well, compare that. Compare Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, with uh, South Carolina versus Katzenbach, 12 years later, 1966. I'm going to read you a little bit of Chief Justice Earl Warren's opinion. Here's Earl Warren. The Voting Rights Act was designed by Congress to banish the blight of racial discrimination in voting which has infected the electoral process in parts of our country for nearly a century. There, no beating around the bush there. I mean, he's, he's calling it the blight of racial discrimination, which has infected the electoral process in parts of our country for nearly a century. And then he goes on and he elaborates. And in fact, he spends a couple of pages describing the history of racial disfranchisement, racial suppression at the ballot box. He talks about what occurred after the fall of Reconstruction. He talks about 
uh, 18, the 1890s, starting in Mississippi and going through all of the Deep South stage and the, and the constitutional changes that were put in place specifically to exclude and to oust black voters. So he drops a footnote. He drops a footnote in which he, he says, well, you know, let's talk about South Carolina. Since, since South Carolina is, is suing the, uh, the um, uh, uh, attorney general, let's talk about the history of South Carolina. And so he says, let's, let's go back to the very important Constitutional Convention of 1895. And he quotes Ben Tillman, known in South Carolina as Pitchfork Bill T uh, uh, Ben Tillman. And he quotes Ben Tillman, frankly explaining what's going on with the Constitutional Convention of 1895. He quotes him, quote, the only thing we can do as patriots and as statesmen is to take from the ignorant blacks every ballot that we can under the laws of our national government. Now, this is something actually that Earl Warren uh, did time and again in uh, his opinions. In fact, some of his most uh, effective opinions was sort of the, uh, a strategy um, strategy of um, revelation in a way. Let people convict themselves using their own words. You saw this in a case last time. I talked about the case uh, Peterson versus City of Greenville. And I talked about how in that case, another Earl Warren opinion in which he put down on the very page the, the ordinance from the City of Greenville in which they stipulated, they talked about how blacks and whites had to be kept 35 feet apart, how they had to be given separate utensils, separate dishes. And I talked about, you know, Warren puts that on the page so that the reader can just see this. No characterization. Let's just, this is the way it was. He also did it in, um, I think, very movingly in a case, Loving versus Virginia, 1967, the case in which the Supreme Court of the United States struck down all existing state laws prohibiting marriage across the race line. And in that, in Loving versus Virginia, Earl Warren quotes the judge who, in, uh, uh, in sentencing a couple from the, the Lovings in Virginia who had committed a felony by marrying one another, the local judge talked about how um, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, God really didn't intend for people of different races to marry, that's why God had put the different races in different continents. And it was only, it was only, you know, it was only mankind's uh, egotism uh, that had uh, sort of disrupted uh, God's plan. And, 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 and Warren sort of quotes him. And he does it here as well. But he does, he does more. He goes on. It's a very, he goes through a, a history of disfranchisement in uh, the United States. So he talks about the imposition in the 1890s and early decades, uh, early decades of the 20th century, the imposition of literacy and understanding tests, noting that these tests were put in place to uh, exclude uh, uh, blacks, the idea being that there were lots of illiterate blacks. Remember, we're not that far away from the end of slavery, so there are many illiterate blacks. Uh, and this would be a way of excluding them without saying anything about race, but nonetheless excluding them disproportionately. And then Warren or a Warren, Chief Justice or a Warren, talks about the safety hatch, how the southern states created a safety hatch for illiterate whites. So, you know, illiterate whites held up their hands and said, well, what about us? We're illiterate, but we don't want to be excluded from the vote. And so their representatives said, oh, yeah, there's something we can do about that. We'll construct grandfather clauses. So we'll say that if you had a grandfather who could vote before, hmm, let's pick a date, eh, 1860, that's a good date. If you had a grandfather that could vote before 1860, you're, you're in. You're in. So even if you can't meet, 
the new requirements, namely literacy, if you had a grandfather who could, who could vote, you're in. Or if you own a certain amount of property, even if you're illiterate, you're in. So he talks about that. Um, he talks about the white primaries. I won't, in an earlier lecture, I mentioned how one of the ways of uh, minimizing uh, black electoral power was simply to exclude blacks from the most powerful political party uh, in the South, namely the Democratic Party. Uh, he talks about racial gerrymandering. You'll, some of you will remember from uh, uh, con law, Gamillion versus Lightfoot. So the authorities in, um, the authorities in uh, Tuskegee decide to get rid of all the uh, 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 black voters by you know, just drawing lines in a squiggly way to just get rid of all the black voters. Um, but he really focuses, what he really focuses on is the um, uh, racial discrimination in the uh, administration of laws that say nothing about race, but that are administered in a racially discriminatory way. So again, you know, literacy tests or an understanding test. On its face, it's universal. Everybody's got to understand the Constitution. Now, what we'll do is we will delegate to local officials the judgment as to whether you've passed the test or not. And it shouldn't be any big surprise who passed the test and who didn't. The wonderful thing about uh, 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 Chief Justice Warren's opinion is he, he sets forth exactly you know, how, what happened. So local officials can determine, you know, do you know enough to become a voter? And Warren talks about, well, you know, what, how did the racial discrimination work out? Racial discrimination worked out like this. Um, uh, whites were asked very simple questions quite often, were given help. He talks about a white person who was asked to uh, interpret the state constitution, and he wrote something that was virtually, you can't even understand it, but that was OK. Um, blacks, some of whom very highly educated. Nope. Uh, don't know enough. When I was reading through this, I thought of a, in my last lecture, I, I made reference to my, my dear father, beloved memory. Here, too, I thought of my beloved father, of uh, uh, my, my beloved father, who used to talk about, well, uh, talk about this, just this issue. Uh, white candidates for registration would be asked to spell cat. Black candidates for registration would be asked to spell chrysanthemum. Um, and this is what happened. Now, over time, over time, uh, <clears throat> black plaintiffs sued, and they said, "Listen, let's let's take a look. Let's just you know, let's take a look um, at what happens to whites who seek to register, what happens to black that seek to register." And these became, you know, there, there was litigation about this, and quite often, quite often, the black plaintiffs would succeed; they would win. And you know, they, they, you know, they'd show, well, look at, look at the help that was given to the white people. Black people were given no help whatsoever. Take a look at, you know, let's, 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 let's see what questions were asked to the whites, and let's see what questions were asked to the blacks. So they, <clears throat> black plaintiffs would win. The problem is that they'd win. Of course, it would take a long time for them to win. I mean, litigation is you know, a slow, difficult process, even in the, under the best of circumstances. Uh, the um, Justice Department figured that you often 6,000 man hours would, go, would be spent in discovery to prepare you know, these cases. That's a lot of hours. <laughs> 
very expensive, very time consuming. Um, and so ultimately what happened is the you know, plaintiffs would win, but uh, it would take them a long time. And sometimes not only would there just be the regular difficulties of litigation, but sometimes these plaintiffs would have to face United States district judges who were very hostile. So, you know, sometimes they would make a good case, but encounter a white supremacist district court judge who would rule against them. They'd have to appeal to the Fifth Circuit. They'd win on appeal. But again, that's even more time. Well, the point of this is, what, what, what Earl Warren said was, you know, this came to the attention of Congress. And in the uh, Congress, in the 1957 Civil Rights Act, the first Civil Rights Act since Reconstruction, the 1957 Civil Rights Act, the 1960 Civil Rights Act, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, in all three of those acts, Congress gave more and more and more power to the Justice Department to bring these suits, to facilitate litigation attacking racial discrimination at the ballot box. But um, one of the things, but, but by 1965, Congress came to the conclusion that litigation was just too slow. It was inefficient. It was just so inefficient. Because even after you'd win a case, so you'd win a case, fine. Uh, the court would enjoin the local authorities from continuing that sort of conduct with respect to that test. The next day, they'd create a new test and say, OK, sue us again. Take two more years, three more years. So really, the, to get to the question, what was the reason for the Civil Rights Act of 1965? The most basic answer to that is the Civil Rights Act of 1965 was called into being because, of a, uh, uh, because Congress reached the conclusion that litigation, case by case litigation, was just too slow, too cumbersome, too inefficient. It was not going to get the job done in terms of uh, uh, repressing suppression, repression, evasion, discrimination uh, at the ballot box. Now, drop a little footnote here. One thing that uh, Chief Justice Warren and the rest of the court do not mention, but I think it's worth mentioning, is this is the way that Chief Justice Warren talks about <coughs> Congress and its decision, its, its, its conclusion that case-by-case -case litigation wouldn't be sufficient. The previous legislation Civil Rights Act of 57, Civil Rights Act of 60, Civil Rights Act of 64. The previous legislation has proved ineffective for a number of reasons. And he, and, you know, again, it's, you know, litigation is onerous, takes time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One thing he does not say, he does not suggest that, or he suggests that this was all a matter of Congress learning over time. He does not suggest that actually there was an intended disutility in the previous acts. Well, it's understandable why he wouldn't say that. But actually, I think that that at least is part of what was going on. In 1957, 1960, and 1964, Congress did indeed pass civil rights legislation that gave more power for case-by-case -case litigation. But one of the reasons why that, why that legislation was passed in the first place is because it was the consequence of compromise. And, co the, and the people who engaged in the compromise knew full well that case-by-case -case litigation was going to be ineffective. That, in fact, was part of the price of getting any legislation at all. So in 1957, just to name one person, 
Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson was well aware of the limitation of case-by-case -case litigation, but he didn't want to go further. So he said, I'll give you case-by-case -case litiga uh, litigation, but nothing more effective. By 1965, things had changed. For one thing, it was no longer Sen Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson. It was now President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Um, and lots of other things had changed. Um, but that's one aspect of the story that doesn't make it into the opinion, but I, I think it's in the background. There's another thing about this opinion that it seems to me is quite worthy of, of mention. Uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren gives out a judicial salute to the Civil Rights Movement. This is, I think it's a quite striking thing. He says this. He's talking about the legislative history of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And he talks about the hearings. He talks about the debates. He talks about the information that was revealed. And then he goes on to say the following. He talks about the, the small number of blacks registered in various jurisdictions. He talks about how in Dallas County, Alabama, where uh, Selma is located, he talks about how um, even after, even after lawsuits, winning lawsuits, the Department of Justice is victorious, but even with that, he talks about how Negro registration rose only from 156 to 383 after four years, although there are approximately 15,000 Negroes of voting age in the county. So he says, after all of this litigation, the numbers of blacks registered had only inched up just a little bit. And then he says the following. Any possibility that these figures were attributable to political apathy were dispelled by the protest demonstrations in Selma in the early months of 1965. He's making reference to the civil rights campaign that really, more than any other civil rights campaign, publicized <laughs> racial exclusion at the ballot box and the various measures that were taken to um, uh, discourage uh, blacks from voting. I mentioned that um, the Supreme Court decided this case, State of South Carolina versus Katzenbach, on March 7th, 1966. March 7th, 1965 was a day that has gone down in the history of the Civil Rights Movement. It's remembered as Bloody Sunday. It was March 7th, 1965. I'm sure that many of you have seen a photograph, a photograph of John Lewis being beaten to the ground by troopers. This opinion came out one year later. I, mean, I don't know if that was just one of those things where there was just, you know, happenstance, but there certainly is poetic justice in that. But in the middle of this opinion, uh, Earl Warren gives a salute to what occurred, Martin Luther King Jr. and the others uh, in March of 1965, through their protest, their nonviolent provocation, and the violence that they received. And it was, of course, that violence, Jim Clark and the rest, Sheriff Jim Clark, and George Wallace and the violent suppression that the nonviolent civil rights protesters received. It was that violent suppression that made it onto the front pages and that triggered really and an sort of an, uh, the, the, the um, widespread belief in the public that something had to be done about this. There's one other thing, I suppose. I, and obviously, I think that Again, if you compare this opinion to Brown versus Board of Education, it's a very different opinion, much more revealing 
in this opinion, uh, let me read you the, the end of the opinion. Again, comparing it to Brown. And again, I'm not, it's not as if I'm damning Brown versus Board of Education. As I mentioned before, there was a good prudential reason for Chief Justice Warren writing Brown the way he wrote it, but, but, but be aware of the way he wrote it. This is the way in which he ends South Carolina versus Katzenbach. Again, just strikingly different than Brown, 12 years later. Hopefully, millions of non-white Americans will now be able to participate for the first time on an equal basis in the government under which they live. We may finally look forward to the day when truly the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. I mean, the Supreme Court, it's not as if the Supreme Court is you know, not, you know, it's being distant. It's actually getting right in there and um, putting its weight behind one of the contending forces in this contest. Before I go to the next subject, well, you know, so, okay, what was accomplished? There is one other thing that I need to mention, and it's in keeping with something that I've mentioned in previous lectures. I've talked about the legal fight and some of the legal actors, and they're very important. But there are other actors as well. And one of the things that does not come across enough, at least in my view, I wish, if, in, in my, I, I wish this part of, of the opinion was, 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 was clearer. Chief Justice Warren talks about the legal measures that were taken to discourage voting in the Deep South. That's appropriate. But of course, that's not, by any means, the whole story. Extra legal measures were a very important, a very important part of the uh, story of black disfranchisement. And so I want to talk a little bit about the extra legal measures. violence and the threat of violence, and some of the people who were on the receiving end of that. Because when people talk about the struggle for voting rights, of course they should know, and especially you all should know, the legal doctrine, the statutes, the applicable federal constitutional law, state constitutional law. You all, of course, should know the legal devices. But there are other people who were part of that story. And their names should be remembered. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about a few of those people. So I want to start. I want to start with Christmas night, December 25th, 1951 when Harry Tyson Moore and his wife, Harriet Vida Sims Moore, were killed by a bomb exploding beneath their home in Brevard County, Florida. This is one of those, this is a, a murder, racially motivated murder, no doubt about it. It's one of those ones that was, remains to this day, remains to this day uh, an open case when Charlie Chris was actually the Attorney General of uh, Florida a few years ago, he tried to do more to try to figure out you know, who perpetrated this killing. He wasn't successful. 
It's now believed that the perpetrators of the killing are all now dead. But I want people to remember December 25th, 1951. It was that couple's 25th wedding anniversary. Um, they were almost certainly targeted on account of Mr. Moore's civil rights activism, particularly his efforts to secure participation in electoral politics free of invidious racial discrimination. He was a longtime leader of the Florida NAACP and a prominent member of the Progressive Voters League. And that's probably what led to his death. Or there's May 7th, 1955, Reverend George Lee of Belzoni, Mississippi, who was murdered after being warned repeatedly to cease urging blacks to register to vote. I mean, on this, it was well known. It was well known. People publicly warned them. You know, you keep this up, and you are going to be killed. He kept it up, and he was indeed killed. Another case in which you know, there, there, there was no prosecution, unsolved case. Or then there was August 13th, 1955. Lamar Smith. Lamar Smith was murdered on the grounds of a courthouse, a courthouse, in broad daylight, in full view of witnesses. And his killing was almost certainly a reprisal for him having attempted to organize fellow blacks to vote. I said he was on a courthouse. He was actually doing his organizational work when he was shot. Another case very similar to that, September 25th, 1961, Herbert Lee. Herbert Lee was gunned down in Liberty, Mississippi, in retribution for encouraging other blacks to vote. In the case of Herbert Lee, again, there were, there were witnesses. And indeed, in this case, the federal government got involved, and there would probably have been a prosecution, but for the following. A person who actually saw the killing got, was, was asked by the FBI, well, what happened? And initially he said, didn't see anything. Then he was promised protection, and he started cooperating, and word got out that he was cooperating, and he was killed. This case the murder of Herbert Lee was particularly important in the Civil Rights Revolution because Herbert Lee was working with a quite extraordinary person by the name of Bob Moses of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, Bob Moses was a black man from New York who went to Mississippi to organize. And it was the killing of Herbert Lee in particular that cemented Bob Moses commitment to the Civil Rights Revolution. Indeed, over time, Bob Moses became one of the great, one of the greats of the Civil Rights Revolution. Few more, few more. Now, let me mention three people. For people of a certain age in this audience, these three names will be absolutely familiar. They will be absolutely familiar. I, I, I would be willing to bet that people of a certain age will know these names. I suspect, however, that there are other people in this audience a bit younger for whom these names will not mean so much. They might have heard them, but they will not have the immediate and emotional impact that these names will have for people of a certain age. James Earl Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Henry Schwerner. There's some people in this room right now for whom those three names were part of a soundtrack of growing up. They would have known them. They would have known those names. These three were killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi by Ku Klux Klansmen with the connivance of local law enforcement officials. 
because they were part of what was known as Freedom Summer. They went to Mississippi in an attempt to do a variety of things, but one of the things they were attempting to do was to fight invidious racial discrimination uh, at the ballot box. And this, the, the killing of those three, became one of the most infamous racially motivated killings in the Civil Rights Revolution. In that case, in that case, at least, at least there was a federal prosecution and some of the people who perpetrated the uh, killings uh, were brought to justice to some degree. A few more. February 26, 1965, Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee, Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed by Alabama state troopers as he tried to protect his grandparents who were protesters in a demonstration seeking to publicize the problem of racial discrimination at the ballot box. His death was among the precipitants of the landmark Selma to Montgomery march. I mentioned the importance of Selma that Chief Justice Warren saluted in South Carolina versus Katzenbach. This killing arose from the events in Selma. Um, Selma actually was a jurisdiction, gave rise to a number of important killings, important to this story. Two weeks after Jimmy Lee Jackson's uh, killing, there was the um, killing of Reverend James Reeb, the Unitarian minister from Boston who was in Selma. This was a fellow who you know, was just minding his own business, looking at the news, talking with people, hearing about the events in Selma. He thought that it was just as a, a religious calling. He felt it important for him to go to pay witness. He did. And for that, he was beaten to death. Two weeks later, after the march, after the completion of the Selma to Montgomery march, Ku Klux Klansman shot and killed Viola Luizzo, who was driving protesters back to Selma. She was a white woman from Detroit, Michigan, who journeyed south alone to assist demonstrators having seen their predicament on televised news coverage. One could go on. One could go on. But uh, as in previous lectures, I, th I thought it was important to just mention, if, if only for a moment, some of the names of the people who were involved in these events. So, you know, when you read South Carolina versus Katzenbach. By all means, pay attention to what's on the page. But don't forget some of the events, some of the names of people who were not on the page, but whose sacrifices were important to that story. Now, um, Congress passed the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The 1965 Voting Rights Act is a very complicated uh, statutory, uh, uh, very complicated statute. The, th the three most important features of the act are, one, the act um, said that there are certain part, designated certain parts of the country in which certain tests, certain tests would simply, um, um, they, they, they just said, we're not going to allow the states to impose certain tests for a certain period of time. So literacy tests in certain parts of the United States are just out. Understanding tests, those are out. They've been used to discriminate. We're tired of it. We're not going to allow you to do that. That was one thing. Second thing the Voting Rights Act said was certain parts of the United States, and they had a very complicated formula, certain parts of the United States um, going forward, we're not going to allow you, 
to impose, to create new tests, anything that you do that affects voting, you're going to have to pre-clear. This is section five of the voting rights. You have to pre-clear with the attorney general or a federal court in Washington, D.C. You're going to have to pre-clear that. And we're, going to, and we're going to impose that because we're well aware of what's happened in the past. In the past, there's been litigation. The day after the plaintiffs win, you just do something different. So we're, not going, to do, we're going to impose a prophylactic rule. Before you do something different, you've got to get permission. And then third, the act said, if the attorney general believes it's necessary, the attorney general can send federal officials, federal examiners, to jurisdictions, and those examiners can register people to vote. So if local officials are, um, are getting in the way, if local officials are doing what local officials have done in the past, for instance, just closing down the registrar's office, you think you're going to register today? No, you're not. I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing for two weeks. If that happens, the Attorney General of the United States can send a federal official. You can go see the federal official and register. Now, did this have an effect? Yeah, it had an effect. Lyndon Johnson thought that the Voting Rights Act was the most important single piece of legislation. It's the most important piece of legislation that he had a hand in crafting throughout his entire career as a senator or as president of the United States. And he was probably, probably correct. Just a little data here. In 1964, 23% of voting age blacks were registered to vote in Alabama, 23%. In 1968, it had gone up to 56%. 23%, 56%. Let's take, well, Mississippi. In Mississippi, 6.7% of voting age blacks were registered in 1964. Only 6.7%. 1968, nearly 60%. Huge jump. And one could go on. One of the things that happened in the aftermath of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is was there was just an immediate jump in registration. So, you know, just the sort of, I mean, this is a very fundamental thing. You know, people just actually taking steps to be able to vote. Tremendous jump. Um, the, um, there were things that happened immediately. So you know, one, one could spend more time, but I think you get the picture. Jump in registration. By the way, by the mid-1980s, by the mid-1980s, the um, numbers of blacks registered to vote in many of the Deep South states, the states that had been designated by the Voting Rights Act of 1965 for special attention, were right along there with the national average. Right along there with the national average. And indeed, in some of those jurisdictions, the percentage of blacks actually being registered voters were higher than in other parts of the country. So just in terms of just actually, you know, people actually just being able to vote made a very quick and decisive difference. And then in the years, the, 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 the years immediately after the Voting Rights Act, you start seeing these news reports. So, you know, in 1966, 
in jurisdictions in which two years before then there had hardly been any black voters, you start seeing black sheriffs being elected to office. In, in certain jurisdictions where people had been turned down to vote you know, on numerous occasions, there are, they, they, these same people who had been just a few years later turned down to vote become elected officials. Uh, before too long, you start having blacks elected as uh, mayors of, uh, of, of cities. And within the, in the, within the, fir, within the you know, 20 year period after uh, the promulgation of the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965, uh, you have hundreds of blacks elected uh, as officials uh, throughout uh, the South. And, you, and then the, the collateral consequences of that. So this, I think, has rightly been seen as uh, a very effective piece of uh, legislation. Now, did the struggle end after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965? Of course not. Of course not. The struggle did not end at all it shifted terrain. So after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, actually becoming registered becomes much easier. That, that part of the fight is won, the registration part of the fight. The part of the fight of actually going to the voting, going to the voting booth and actually putting your, 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 your ballot in the box. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 really puts attention and resources of the federal government and really breaks the back of the old style Jim Crow disfranchisement. I mean, that is broken. But then, but then the struggle shifts to new areas. So after 1965, you know, what do various states do? I think of Mississippi. Immediately after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Mississippi, the Mississippi legislature goes into special session and says, you know what, hmm, there are a whole lot of, uh, of uh, posts, elected posts in Mississippi. We don't think that there should be elections for these various posts. No, the way we think, we think these posts should go from being elected posts to being appointed posts. We think it would be better for the governor to appoint people rather than local people elect. So that happens. And then you know, what do you have? Litigation. Uh, or vote dilution. Again, Mississippi is really the heartland of this, but other places as well. Um, in jurisdictions in which you had previously had um, uh, you had you'd previously had single member districting. Now you have multi-member districting uh, in order to submerge. You could have a large racial minority, but even a large, you know, let's, you know, let's say blacks constitute 40%. Well, if you have a multi-member district and everybody is chosen by majority vote, that 40% can be submerged, and that's what happens. And you had lots of fighting about that. And indeed, lots of litigation. Not only that, but then you had legislative action. The Voting Rights Act, remember last in the one, maybe not the last lecture. Yeah, it was the last lecture. The last lecture I talked about how uh, um, sex, uh, um, Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act never been amended. Voting Rights Act of 1965 has been amended over and over and over and over again. It's been amended, it's been enlarged, it's been strengthened. Why? Because whereas Title II, the fight against Jim Crow at the lunch counter, that fight was won and won so decisively that really the law became beside the point. Here, here, with respect to voting, that is a struggle that has continued. And it's because of the continuation of that struggle that 
voting rights litigation, still a very important part of civil rights litigation in general. And that's one of the reasons why there's still continued controversy over uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. One last point, then at least we'll have a few minutes for questions. I'm talking about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As we're gathered here right now, the Supreme Court of the United States has pending, in fact, for all we know, the decision's already been made. There's a case pending before the Supreme Court of the United States, Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder, a case that puts in question Section 5, the preclearance part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, right as we speak. And at least from the people who, I mean, if, if, you, if you listen to the oral argument, many commentators think that Section 5 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act will probably be invalidated on the grounds, this is sort of an interesting grounds, on the grounds that the fight has been won. Chief Justice Roberts says, you know, things have changed. Uh, Justice Thomas says, you know, declare victory. And since things have changed, since there is no longer, at least the claim would be, since Congress has been unwilling or unable to show a continuing need for um, uh, preclearance, the argument is that the federalism cost, the cost of uh, the, the encroachment on state prerogatives is such that there really is no continuing justification for uh, the preclearance section of the Voting Rights Act. Th that's an issue that's before the Supreme Court right now. And uh, we'll know the, the answer to that question in a few months. But the fact that that case is on the Supreme Court's docket is itself an indication of the way in which the Voting Rights Act of 1965 continues to reverberate in the uh, life and law of the United States. All right, um, comments, questions, objections? Yes? So to what extent should we be disappointed then that Congress for 2006 not updating its formula for preclearance in the measuring of the tester device still, I think it's at, I think it's 72 still. Yeah. If we do have a facial invalidation of Section 5 under the 2006 formula, which is you know, the 1982 formula, how mad should we be at Congress? Um, Congress was warned. Could Congress have done a, a better job of, uh, of substantiating its position? Yes. But if you're asking my advice in terms of the allocation of uh, blame, for goodness sakes, don't throw a rock at uh, Congress, at least not before you throw a rock at the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, the fact of the matter is, the, ba the basic issue, the basic claim is that the Voting Rights Act of 1965, at least the preclearance provision, is an anachronism. It's no longer needed. Well, I mean, to a very large extent, it seems to me that that sounds like a policy issue to me. That sounds like a, that, that sounds like a matter of political judgment to me. Where does the Supreme Court of the United States get off uh, substituting its judgment versus the judgment of the Congress with respect to a matter like that? So could the Congress have done uh, a better job especially in light, I mean, it's not as if, it's not as if Congress didn't know that this issue was, you know, out there. Of course it knew it. 
In fact, there's a way in which Congress had been on notice about this for you know, a good long time, way before 2006. I didn't mention, though now I will, that there was a dissent in um, Katzenbach, in South Carolina versus Katzenbach. Justice Black, Justice Hugo Black dissented. His view was, he said, listen, I don't think that the preclearance provision is constitutional. He had two beefs with preclearance. He said, number one, I think that this is the Congress is by, by telling the state, by telling covered jurisdictions that they must get permission from this court in Washington, D.C., that is telling this court in Washington, D.C. to give an advisory opinion. Because actually, you know, there's, there's no established law that the court is reviewing. The state is coming forth saying, we want to have this law. And the court, and you know, Black's opinion was, this is essentially an advisory opinion, and Article III doesn't provide that. That was one of his beefs. His other beef, though, was stronger. And it's more, and it's more pertinent to, uh, to what you're asking. This is what, this is what uh, Hugo Black, and Hugo Black, man, what an interesting character he was. I mean, here's a former Ku Klux Klansman, for goodness sakes. Becomes, you know, he's a senator. Becomes a justice, one of FDR's appointees. To a large extent, not totally, in a complicated relationship to the Civil Rights Revolution. I'll talk about Justice Black tomorrow. But with respect to this, he was, he was, he was strong in terms of his um, commitment to enforcing the 15th Amendment. He, he, he really was. But he did say this. And we, we hear echoes of this in the Supreme Court today. If all the provisions of our Constitution which limit the power of the federal government and reserve other power to the states are to mean anything, they mean at least that the states have power to pass laws and amend their constitutions without first sending their officials hundreds of miles away to beg federal authorities to approve them. Now, you know, it's so interesting. I, I remember as a law student when we read uh, of an Owen Fiss's class, great teacher, wonderful person. But when we read uh, 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 South Carolina versus Katzenbach, we read the, you know, the Warren's opinion with a great deal of care. When it came to Black's descent, ah, that was just, you know, some, you know, this is, this is some idiosyncratic, you know, read it if you want. But this is just viewed as sort of a very idiosyncratic, crabby view. Well, it shows you ideas have a funny way of coming back. And the fact of the matter is, that idea is, you know, actually um, been embraced by a substantial part. We'll see if it's a majority, but certainly already we know a substantial part of the Supreme Court of the United States. So they were on notice. And could they have been more attentive to this issue? Yes. I'm going to ask myself a question. Where does the Constitution of the United States come into this? We talk about the 15th Amendment. You know, we're talking about you know, effectuating the 15th Amendment. And as our beginning point, as our premise, you know, we have this 15th Amendment, and the whole thing is to effectuate it, you know, realize it. Because, of course, we know that the 15th Amendment is great. Is it? Is the 15th Amendment so great? 
Is part of the problem maybe the 15th Amendment? What does the 15th Amendment say? You know, I mean, if you if, go out on the street, you ask Americans, you ask Americans, do you have a constitutional right to vote? Most Americans say, would say yes to that. Most Americans would say, yeah, I have a constitutional right to vote. What's the street right in front of the law school? What's the name of the street right in front of the law school? Somebody? Okay, whatever that street is. You could do it. I mean, you could, you could do this experiment yourselves. Law students, you could do it. Just first 10 people coming down the street, you just ask them, do you have a constitutional right to vote? I would be willing to bet most people would say yes. Of course, that's not true. It's not true. You don't have a constitutional right to vote. You have a constitutional right to be free of exclusion for certain reasons. In 1870, in 1868, 1869, 1870, when there was debate about the 15th Amendment, there were some people who wanted to implant in our constitutional regime a constitutional right to vote. Anybody who's a citizen should just be able to vote. Let's say, let's say that in the Constitution. Hmm, you say that. Women are citizens. You want women to vote? No, we can't have that. So let's figure out some sort of way that, you know, we can allow maybe, you know, Blacks to vote, black men, but women, no, we don't want that. And then there were some parts of the country that says, yeah, you know, we've got these, we've got immigrants from various places. Some are from China. Some are from, you know, some are from, some are from Ireland. Some are from other places. Some of these people, these newcomers, we don't, we don't, we don't like them. We don't like the looks of them. We want to figure out a way to exclude them from the ballot box. Maybe the black people in the South, these black men, we'll let them vote. But we've got to have a formula that will allow us to exclude these other people but let the black men in. That's why we got the voting right. That's why we have the 15th Amendment written as it is. It's a very thin read. It simply says you can't exclude people on the basis of race. OK, fine. What about literacy? What about property? What about where you're from? What about gender? You see the point. Part of the problem, as far as I'm concerned, is our Constitution. And the fact of the matter is, we don't have as democratic a Constitution as we ought to have. So in thinking about these issues, as far as I'm concerned, nothing should be off the table, including our fundamental constitutional law. Thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow.